um, in 1919, Einstein wrote this very short paper for short article for the Times of London, in which he introduced a, a very famous distinction between two types of theory. He claimed that relativity theory is a principal theory, like thermodynamics, uh, and not a constructive theory like the kinetic theory of gases. Uh, this paper was nearly forgotten for many decades, but uh, has, attracted, uh, has attracted a lot of attention in the last decades. It started from 2005, around 2005. Um, Harvey Brown, Michel Janssen, Pablo Acuna, for example, the philosophical literature and philosophy of physics has uh, considered this paper often, not always, but often as a Einstein's original insight into the natural space-time. Um, around this paper has been um, discussion, a debate about uh, dynamical versus, versus geometrical explanation in space-time theory has been constructed, is still, is still going on. Uh, in the historical literature on the opposite, the, the trivial paper, nothing original, the distinction is well known, you can find it everywhere. Surprising paper in which you can find in a very old paper by Lawrence, the very same distinction before, before relativity was introduced. Uh, so the physics of principles opposed to the physics of models. There was very well known stuff that everyone knew. The paper is nothing, is nothing special. Uh, I, I'm simplifying the discussion, but these are two tendencies in, in the literature. Uh, both tendencies, both assessments entail, entail only part, part of the truth, as you can, as you can imagine. Um, um, the problem, why it is hard to understand what Einstein was trying to do in that short paper, is that the distinction has two meanings, which, which are entangled and confused by Einstein, not only in that short paper, but in many other passages. Uh, on the one hand, the distinctions has to do with, let's say, with the context of justification, to use this expression, is really distinctions between two types of theory, two ways to justify a theory. But uh, in other passages, in another context, the distinction has to do with the context of discovery. Uh, is there are two types of methods of way to of finding new theories, not of classifying existing theories. These two aspects has to be disentangled and uh, clearly understood uh, in order to um, um, uh, clarify Einstein's distinction. Um, uh, to do this, I will uh, revise the textual evidence that we have, uh, which is much wider than only the paper in 1919, on which most of commentators concentrate their attention. Um, I will try to show how the comparison between relativity and thermodynamics have been introduced, has been introduced already in the Swiss years, early days of relativity, and to defend, Einstein used it to defend himself against uh, various criticism, especially one criticism on which we will concentrate. Um, uh, in the Berlin years, only in those years, when Einstein moved to Berlin, um, uh, commentaries and transform it into the real methodology, uh, into real logic of discovery, how to find new theories. Uh, and you can see how Einstein tried to apply the same strategy to general relativity. Uh, finally, in the Princeton years, when we moved to, to the US, uh, there are several instances in which people ask Einstein about this. Early years on relativity, and uh, he uh, used the comparison between thermodynamics and relativity to describe historically how he found relativity theory. Um, um, that is, he, he consciously found, tried to imitate the model of thermodynamics. Um, in, to give an uh, overview of what I think is a general image that we, we will try to find in this uh, analyzing this textual evidence, I think. Uh, the model is at the end very simple. Uh, Einstein put it some uh, in several passages uh, roughly in this way. A physicist is someone who tries to understand how a machine work, a clock a watch, a machine, a clock, which is enclosed and sealed in an unbreakable case. We can open the clock and you want to understand what is going on. A good physical theory 
uh, Einstein never believed a good physical theory is simply a theory making predictions about the behavior or the visible parts of the clock, um, a phenomenological theory. There was ne never been, even in the early days, Einstein's ambition. Uh, Einstein insisted that the goal of physics is to understand what is going on inside of the clock to explain why the visible parts behave as they do. We can open the case, this is the, uh, the, the thought experiment. So we need, we need a theory, we need a theory and this theory must construct an hypothetical model of what, uh, of the clockwork, of the mechanism inside, the hidden mechanism inside of the clock. There are two ways of doing this. What can pursue a constructive strategy? Uh, search for the dynamical laws, if you have them, if not modify the, the known the dynamical laws uh, in the hope of finding, uh, or constructing a model of the, what is happening in the clockwork, maybe a mechanical model, for instance, uh, if you keep the law of mechanics or a principal strategy. The first strategy is effective if there are not many possibilities. Sometimes the possibilities you can come up with, you can come up with are too many and a good strategy is try to restrict them. So search for an empirical principle that allows you to restrict the number of possible models. For instance, models that do not satisfy the energy conservation had to be rejected in advance. Uh, and you end up with two types of theorists at the same time. Uh, theorists that actually entails the laws of nature uh, and uh, these laws of nature might, these equations uh, representing the laws of nature might have solutions and these solutions can serve as models to describe, um, in, in our case, the mechanism inside of the clock, or uh, principal theories. Principal theories do not describe what is happening inside of the clock, but they simply put constraints on the possible dynamical laws, um, uh, the, the possible dynamical laws have to satisfy. Sometimes these constraints are so stringent that one end up with one single law as an effective strategy of finding the, law, the laws. The today debate uh, had uh, tried to claim that uh, the, re the, 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 the point of the distinction was dynamical versus geometrical. At the end, special relativity should be transformed in a constructive theory, in a theory that constructs a model. Uh, Brown uh, would claim it is a model of uh, matter, of the structure of matter and fields. Uh, Janssen would claim that it is a model of space-time, but both claim at the end, special relativity constructive theory. One important exception uh, on which I will uh, rely is Mark Lang. I think Mark Lang uh, correctly uh, suggested another opposition, uh, which I think is much more powerful for one to understand Einstein's distinction, the opposition between coincidences and constraints. So special relativity, if we, from this point of view, is a principle theory. And I'll try to defend this claim against the uh, widespread opinion in, uh, in today's literature. Constraints are a requirement that all possible dynamical laws must satisfy. And this is what the relativity principle at the end one wants to be. And coincidences are simply requirements as existing law, existing dynamical laws happen to satisfy. Uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, because this distinction clearly um, uh, addresses some important uh, um, uh, philosophical or, uh, accounts for some important philosophical reflections that you can find right at the end of the 19th century, for instance. I think one of the sources, I cannot prove it theologically, but it's plausible one of the sources of Einstein distinctions was where Planck's uh, lectures on thermodynamics. Um, uh, Planck's noticed the following. Let's say that the energy principle. There are two ways to justify the energy principle. When Helmholtz discovered the energy principle, uh, Helmholtz claimed that if all a phenomena of nature can be reduced to mechanics or particles interacting by means of central forces, depending on distance, then the energy principle is a formal consequence of this assumption, is a coincidence. Uh, if all phenomena of nature happen to be described by mechanical laws, then the consequence, a byproduct of this, uh, of this fact is the energy principle. Uh, but Planck preferred to give another justification of the energy principle. Uh, let's, we know that after centuries, we have tried to construct a perpetual mobile of the first kind. We never uh, made it. Um, we used 
mechanical, thermal, chemical processes, whatever you want. So let's turn the question around. How should the laws of nature look like if the perpetual mobility should be impossible? The energy principle is a constraint to impose, to impose whatever laws of nature, might be electromagnetic, mechanical, whatever you want, if the perpetual mobility should be impossible. Uh, actually, Planck wanted to extend this justification to the entropy principle. For Boltzmann, the entropy principle is a consequence of the kinetic field of gases. For Planck, it was an absolute principle's consequence of the impossibility of constructing a perpetual mobility of the second kind. But what interested us is that Einstein clearly, or clearly, I, would, I will claim, I will try to prove that Einstein uh, tried to apply the same methodology, the same justification to relativity principle. Uh, but for Lorentz, the relativity principles, the impossibility of detecting the motion of the Earth uh, through the ether was uh, valid if Maxwell equations were the correct theory of, uh, of radiation, if all forces of natural electromagnetic, in particular the forces keeping together, uh, for instance, our rods or and our clocks, for instance, if the mass of all particles are electromagnetic, then uh, the relativity principle is a coincidence of this electromagnetic theory of matter and radiation. But Einstein inverted the question, just like Planck with the energy principle, or with the entropy principle. But we tried many times to detect the motion of the earth through the ether. Let's turn the questions around. Activity principle is the constraint, sorry, I repeated, that all dynamical laws, of whatever kinds, electromagnetic or new that we don't know, have to satisfy if the ether, as the, if the detection of the ether is to be impossible. This is roughly what Einstein says, wrote in a undated letter to his friend Solovan. What must the laws of nature be like so that it is impossible to construct a perpetual motion machine of either the first of the second kind? But the, the, the question is the same for relativity theory. Here, I paraphrase a bit but to, to shorten the, uh, the, the quotation. What must be the laws of nature? What must, what must the laws of nature be like? So it is impossible to construct a device that detects the ether drift. Let me, this is the general scheme. Now I have to try to extract this general scheme from the actual textual evidence. Uh, I've forgotten to premise as this paper will be heavily historical. Um, uh, and this is more complicated, but let's try. We are in 1905, Einstein wrote his celebrated paper. If you look at the paper, the paper is structured like this. Uh, relativity postulate and light postulate, the, the very beginning, they are empirically motivated and incompatible. New kinematics, the Lorentz transformations, in order to make them compatible, the Lorentz transformations, the new kinematics is either true or false. Uh, if we interpret uh, coordinates, as reading of rod and clocks, but we're expecting to detect to, uh, some effects, some relativistic effects. For instance, if atoms are good clocks, we expect, if the new kinematics is valid, to observe the transverse Doppler effect. Uh, the new kinematics is set independently of any dynamics. Maxwell equations are not mentioned, other equations are, are other dynamical laws are not mentioned. The dynamical part now check if the existing law are already compatible with the principle. Um, already compatible with the principle. Um, Maxwell equations happen to be already compatible with the principle. On the opposite, Newton's laws of motion are not, and they have to be changed. So they have compatible, sorry, with the principle, with the new kinematics. Let's see how does it work. It's very simple. So let's uh, uh, take an electron be addressed uh, at the origin of the, of the co-moving system uh, K1. Uh, this is the laws of Newton laws of motion for the force uh, X is an uh, um, electric force uh, acting on a, on, a, on a charge. Now let's introduce the Lorentz transformations uh, uh, for the coordinates and the transformations of the electric magnetic field. And we get this new equation, which is different from um, Newton's, uh, Newton's law. Uh, you can see the red uh, part of the formula are uh, simply the, uh, the claim that 
the coefficient the proportionality between proportional proportionality between mass and acceleration is uh, different from the um, component of the force pro um, uh, parallel to motion, the longitudinal component and transverse component second, a second that the mass increase with the velocity in a, in a way which is proportional to the Lorentz factor. The longitudinal mass increased with a factor which is proportional with a cube of the Lorentz factor and transverse, ma transverse mass with uh, a proportion, increased proportion to the Lorentz factor. Uh, this is a new uh, dynamics of particle of charged particles, which uh, Einstein claims applies to electrons, but to electrons in our sense of the word. So every every possible charged particle in general. This is a key distinction between Einstein's approaches, which we shall see, and contemporary approaches. Electron in our sense of the word. Uh, this is a result. The result can be tested, but to test the result, we need the real electrons, so to say, uh, simply because real electrons move very fast, uh, emitted by cathode rays, cathode rays or beta rays. And so we can check if really the mass of these electrons increase with velocity. Uh, this last paragraph, which is not very less famous than other paragraphs of the, of the 1905 paper by Einstein, is uh, the reason why the paper attracted attention. The first time the paper was um, 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 was mentioned was by uh, Walter Kaufman. Kaufman was famous experimentalist, and he noticed this paper and um, uh, inserted it in his uh, by giving the result of his experiment to test the variability of mass of the electron. Electrons emitted by beta rays, very fast, approach the velocity of light. We can measure how hard it is to accelerate them. Uh, um, uh, the faster they, they travel. Um, the result uh, was the following. At the time, there were different models of the electron. Uh, one was the spherical electron uh, suggested by Abraham. Uh, and this is the, the law in which the uh, transverse ma mass increased with velocity. It's not important for our goals. The second was the Lorentz Einstein electron, which is a deformable electron, which increased in a much simpler way, which we have seen before. This is equivalent to the formulation that we used before. Uh, Abrams electron, electron one. Um, this is the mo most plausible model of the electron according to Kaufman, uh, and the results are strongly against the Lorentz Einstein model. But uh, Kaufman noticed also something different. He noticed that his hypothesis of the form of electron leads to the relativity principle. So Lorentz shows that uh, his hypothesis of the form of electron leads to the relativity principle without excluding, without ruling out that the same result can be achieved in other ways. Lorentz and Einstein's is the same theory, but there is a conceptual difference. Lorentz starts with his model of the electron, and he claims that if this model is, this model is correct, the relativity principle can be saved. Einstein does the opposite. It starts with the relativity principle and obtains as a consequence, a certain variability of the mass of the electron, which corresponds to that of Lorentz. Uh, as the, also Planck, uh, who defended Einstein's derivation, say, okay, the Kaufman results are against the Lorentz uh, Einstein electron, but look, Einstein's approach is too good to be abandoned. Look, Lorentz's approach is as a, as a problem. Lorentz needs, keeps Newton's equation of motions in, in unchanged. It needs a particular electron model to explain why the mass of electrons are increased in spite of the fact that for Newton's laws of motion, the mass is constant. Einstein does something which is the opposite. It changes the laws of nature, the, the Newton's the dynamics of particles, so that it complies to a relativity principle. And in this way, he obtains um, uh, the same variability of mass uh, of the electron with velocity. Uh, but in this case, no electron model is required because uh, uh, the new law applies to whatever charged particles, uh, macroscopic, microscopic, or whatever type, because the Newton's law of, of motion has been changed. The dynamics of particles has been changed. Uh, we can see a difference, Planck say, uh, Planck uh, pointed out, if you change the definition of the laws of motion of the electron. Uh, instead of using force mass acceleration, you use force 
uh, rate of change of the um, of momentum in time. And Einstein, Einstein's derivation becomes much more simple. And you can see that there is a constant mass m, and what is changed is simply a new definition of momentum. Momentum does not increase linearly with velocity, but with a more complicated law. So you don't need any explanation, uh, any model of the electron. Uh, it is not necessary to ascribe to electron, neither a spherical shape, nor even other shape, in order to arrive to a certain dependence of inertia on speed. Problem, people were not very satisfied. Uh, Aaron Fest, great physicist of the time and will become soon a uh, great, uh, great uh, friend, uh, friend of Einstein. Uh, uh, or it's not true that you, you don't need any assumption about the form of the electron, at least about the shape of the electron, you need one. A non-spherical charge rigid body will not move force in force-free motion, which is not symmetric, will not move in force-free motion. We'll be forced to rotate. It was a claim already made by others, uh, Abraham, for instance, uh, simply because um, 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 uh, the component of velocity are not parallel to, to the momentum are not parallel to the motion. Uh, so you need to assume that the electron is symmetric, at least this. Or Lorentzian electrodynamics, it, as it was formulated by Mr. Einstein, which is relativity, special relativity, is considerably a complete system. It's a proper theory. The theory cannot remain silent about the structure of the electron. Uh, the theory should say if the electron is symmetric or not, and should attain the result by pair deduction. If a symmetric electron cannot have a, a force-free motion, then the theory is false. The relativity principle is violated. We could notice if the electron is moving uh, because the non-symmetric electrons would rotate. Uh, if um, a non-symmetric electron can move, the theory should explain it. Here, Einstein, for the first time, used the comparisons between relativity theory and thermodynamics. Look, the principle of relativity, or more exactly principle of relativity together with the principle of constant velocity of light, is not a complete system. Let's say it's not a proper theory. It is a heuristic principle, um, makes only statements about rods, clocks, and light, and light rays. Uh, it's only a new kinematics. Um, how the principle obtains new results by requiring that similar related laws uh, uh, should satisfy the new kinematics. Uh, it's only this requirement that allows to make new statements. Thus, we are, we are not dealing with a system uh, in which the individual laws are entailed, but with a principle, just like the second principle of thermodynamics, which permits the reduction of certain laws to others. So there is a comparison between second principle of thermodynamics and relativity principle. Uh, we introduce a new kinematics, which is confirmed by rods, clocks, um, which simply makes claim about rods and clocks and like signals that can be confirmed independently or, or not confirmed, of course, independently on any dynamical laws, then that it's, not a, it's not a theory at all. We don't have a theory. We, we don't have any individual laws like uh, mechanics, electrodynamics, uh, laws of this size are not um, uh, entailed in, the, in special relativity. The theory only uses heuristic principle. Uh, we obtain new results by requiring that the laws satisfy the new, uh, the new kinematics. Let's see how can we find that the mass of the electron is variable. Uh, Einstein says that all the electron theorists do, did something like this. They construct a particular model of the electron. Uh, have to make the assumption about the shape of the electron and nature of mass. And as a consequence, they obtain the correct or incorrect, it depends on the experimental results, of course, of a certain variation, certain law of variation of the mass of the electron. Uh, the electron is att attached to a problem. The electron, the electron has to be attached to a rigid scaffold. Charge would fly away if it's not attached to something. Positive charge would not stay together. Uh, negative charge, or be, repel, equal charge repel each, other's, each other. Um, uh, thus, the laws that govern the motion uh, of such a structure cannot be derived by electrodynamics alone. Actually, even the people that, that thought that all mechanics can be reduced to electrodynamics but they were too ambitious because actually, uh, even in this case, we need some non-electrodynamics forces to keep together the electron. Uh, 
But the relativity principle proceeds in a completely different way. Uh, we start with the given Newton's laws of motion uh, valid for slowly moving electrons. Uh, these are assumed to be given by experience. Um, then, as we have seen, we assume that they are at a certain form uh, with respect to the coordinate system K1, co-moving with the electron, apply the Lorentz transformation, we obtain the new law valid for all possible velocities. Uh, the new laws implies that the mass is not constant. Uh, so we obtain the result without making any assumption about the structure of the electron, contrary to uh, in other electron theories. Uh, why do we need a model of the electron? Of course, uh, we need to know why electron exists, uh, what is the charge, uh, uh, what keep them together. We absolutely need a theory of electron, but what we know is not sufficient to obtain it. The, what did Einstein called the electromechanical worldview, electromagnet, electromagnetism plus mechanic was clearly false, was very probably false because of Planck's radiation law. So Maxwell equations were not even good to describe the radiation, quantum hypothesis uh, in empty space, probably not even to describe, and not even, probably were not even, uh, as a consequence were not also good to describe matter. Uh, Newton's particle dynamics probably had to be abandoned. So we cannot start with this law to uh, and construct a model of the electron. Uh, so my approach is much more uh, uh, safe than the approach of electron theorists. This was Einstein explained to another correspondent, Sommerfeld. Um, uh, first of all, now the question whether I consider relativity treatment of the mechanics of the electron as definitive, no, certainly not. Um, this is the same problem. Uh, is the relativistic mechanic of the electron uh, definitive? Not. Same question. We don't have the um, uh, Sommerfeld, Sommerfeld's letter, but this is probably the question I'll be asking. How can you derive the variability of the mass of the electron without giving me a model of the electron? Uh, my theory is not definitive, certainly not. Um, we need a fundamental theory that builds uh, its structures from elementary foundations. We need a model of the electron and of radiation. Still, I don't have it. So relativity theory is at this moment like thermodynamics before Boltzmann without the molecular uh, theory of gases. Um, the Michelson Morrissey experiment showed us that something is going on in the relationship between electrodynamics and mechanics. Still, um, I don't have a theory of electrical and mechanical processes. I'm led to this pessimistic view, primarily as the consequences of endless vain attempts to interpret a universal second constant in Planck's radiation law in an intuitive way. That is to give a model of uh, light quanta, um, of light quanta. Uh, I doubt that Maxwell equations are valid even in empty space. So again, relativity principles is only like the second principle of electrodynamics. Uh, we need to construct a model of the electron, but we cannot do it because Maxwell equations and uh, um, Newtonian mechanics are probably not valid, not from, it's not from limited, for limited cases. Um, so in these in this circumstances, it was better to search for a general principle uh, like the second principle of thermodynamics, which does not imply any model of the electron. Possible model of the electrons, uh, Einstein explained to Sommerfeld, we have two ways. Again, we can imagine the electrons as a rigid body endowed with charge, uh, but in this case, the problem, we don't have a theory of the rigid motion in special relativity. At this point, Einstein could not describe arbitrary rigid motion in special relativity. We shall see, so, so see this is a problem that was um, uh, debated and addressed by in, uh, Max Born some years later. Uh, but there's another model, which I prefer because I don't need a scaffold that keeps together the electron to imagine that the electron is, this, is a solution of a non-Maxwellian electrodynamics. I hope by changing Maxwell equations, I can find a theory which has the electron in light quanta as solutions. So I don't need any more um, a scaffold to keep together the electron to introduce by hand the reason why electrons have this charge and this mass 
and on so on and so forth. Um, um, great success of the theory, some months later uh, at Cologne, Minkowski gave, gave his famous speech with the introduction of space spacetime. Uh, empirical confirmation, Kaufman uh, found negative results, but Booker found positive results. So theory relativity became, let's, let's put it as this, mainstream. At the same time, uh, people were not satisfied. Uh, Ehrenfest thought that Einstein's answer was not sufficient. Uh, it appears to me that the electron must necessarily be solved. I need to, to know why electron exists at all. Uh, a spherical electron because of the static electric repulsion, repulsion should explode, as I said. Sommerfeld, I miss the clarity and um, causality of your old theory, of Lorentz theory, said Sommerfeld to, to Lorentz, in which you gave us the model of the electron that explained why the mass of the electron is variable. Uh, Max Born, Planck, Einstein, Minkowski, all these people, the mass is not electromagnetic, so we don't know why the mass is variable. The electricity is structureless. We don't know why, what keeps the electricity together in an electron. As a consequence, one does not understand what electrons actually are, why they exist, why they do not explode with an audible crack. Um, so Born himself started to formulate it, attempted to formulate his own theory of the electron. Uh, Define the notion of rigid body in special relativity. This was the reason why he did it uh, with all the problems uh, that, that this definition had. But in this way, he hoped to, to give a relativistic, full electromagnetic electron that would explain why the mass is variable with velocity. So Einstein derivation is only a generalization of the equation of motions that are adapted to relativity principles. Uh, the concept of mass is modified, but it's not explained. Uh, Einstein. Pursued, pursued is attempt. I want to construct the electron. Uh, the scaffold is not a good idea. Um, I need something which is, does not come from electrodynamics, uh, which has to, to, to be introduced by hand. Uh, so if I have to avoid the rigid scaffold, I can imagine that the electron is a solution of a non-Maxwellian electrodynamics. Uh, I could um, kill two birds with one stone, get the light quanta, no one believed in like quanta at the time, but Einstein believed in them, uh, and the uh, existence of the electron with one single theory. Of course, both attempts failed. Uh, Born's attempt failed because the electron could not even rotate for the problems that the definition of rigidity in special relativity. And uh, Einstein could not find right kind of field equations that could deliver what he wanted. So around 1911, the situation was as it was at the beginning. Um, uh, Einstein realized that the word, he, he approached, he used two strategies to find new theories. The one was in which there are not so many possibilities. Einstein says uh, explicitly, I pursue this non Maxwellian electrodynamics because I think that given certain constraints, the possibilities are not so many. But he failed. Uh, I no longer ask whether this quanta really exists. I'm not trying to longer to construct them because I, know, I now know that my brain is incapable of doing so. I've come to the opinion of many fruit, fruit, fruitless attempts based, uh, um, um, sorry, something I forgot me here, based on merely constructing uh, that it is more advantageous to proceed without making use of any model. So the constructive approach, as I called it before, failed. So Einstein realized, let's use the other approach. Uh, let's prefer clearly the other approach, the approach I use in special relativity, which is much more successful. Successful. When there are too many possibilities, as in this case, then it's better to search for general principles that constrain, sorry, there's a, it has too much, uh, the numbers of possible laws I can choose. So the question is, which are the general laws of physics can still be expected to be valid in the domain in which we are concerned? This is the question we have to ask. Um, so we have to draw conclusion about the admissibilities, admissibility of certain theories um, that are compatible with this, with this principle. This is exactly what Einstein had learned, uh, had learned by, uh, by working on special relativity. This is the scheme of how a theory works. This is a passage which is quite uh, particularly clear. There are many others, of course. The heuristic value of relativity theory consists in the fact that it provides a constraint 
and all the system of equations is expressed as general laws of nature must satisfy. So the theory expresses a constraint. All such, such system must be so constructed that they are uh, they satisfy the Lorentz invariant. Minkowski did nothing more than present a special scheme to inspect the Lorentz invariance of the known laws of measure. Uh, this is what actually means Minkowski did. Relativity theory by no means give us tool to deduce in previously unknown laws from, uh, from nature, uh, of nature from nothing. It's not that we have the new principle if we can, by pure deduction, deduce the na natural laws, but we have a constraint a criterion to constrain the possibilities. In this respect, it is comparable to the laws of energy conservation and the law of thermodynamics. Newtonian mechanics must be modified, as, I, as we saw, to satisfy the criterion of relativity. As a consequence, the altered mechanics equations are proved to be applicable to cathode rays uh, um, and beta rays, sorry, something went wrong, that is to motion of electrons. Electrons serve to test the new theory. So what is the scheme? The scheme is the following. We have a new kinematics based on the two principles. We have a uh, um, dynamical law. Uh, this is the, um, uh, the, the starting point. Express a dynamical law mathematically, uh, Newton's laws of motion, Maxwell equations, whatever you want, uh, with respect to the system car using the four coordinates. Apply the Lorentz transformations. Obtain the mathematical form of the equations in the moving system. The question is, are the two expressions identical? If yes, then the law is, is correctly uh, formulated. If no, uh, then the law is not acceptable. Modify the law, as we have done, as Einstein has done with Newton's uh, particle dynamics, test the new relativistic effect. Uh, then compared to previous electron theories, the theory uh, does not need any model of the electron. Um, we have only two general principles that constrain the possible laws of nature. In this case, that we constrained the modification of Newton's particle dynamics to one, pos to one possible solution, and we obtained the variability of mass of the electron. Uh, the approach is more powerful than the other electron theories because we don't need, uh, we, have, we don't have to rely on a theory which probably is not valid, like Maxwell electrodynamics. Um, now let's extend this epistemological strategy, this logic of discovery to other cases. Uh, Einstein's problem at the time was um, gravitational theory. So we have to go from Maxwell, uh, just, okay, sorry, uh, comparison. Maxwell went to uh, Columbal exostatic to Maxwell electrodynamics. So Einstein wants to do something similar, to go to Newton gravitostatic, uh, to Poisson's equation, to Einstein's uh, gravitodynamics, uh, to his own gravito gravitodynamics, um, uh, as we might call it, uh, to a field theory of gravitation. How to do it? Uh, if you try to proceed directly in a constructive way, to use the expression I used before, then there are too many possibilities. Uh, is uh, the gravitational gravitation expressed by a scalar, by uh, four vectors, by a six vector? This was the debate that was going on at the time. So strategy, search of a pre for a principle that limits the numbers of possibilities. Do we have a principle like this? Of course, this is the equivalence principle. The equivalent principles uh, limit the number of possibilities um, uh, and define the way to search for the new theory. In particular, uh, the uh, simplify a bit, of course, the equivalent principles force us to abandon the convention that there are privileged reference of frame. So we have to formulate the laws so they are valid for all possible frame of reference. As let's move to Berlin now. So this is the end of the Swiss period. So we have started to define this more general, special activity was very successful. Einstein extract from general for special relativity a general methodological view. And the occasion to present it was in Berlin when he gave uh, his inaugural address, becoming a member of Prussian Academy of Science, which is the strategy. In general, to find the laws of nature, a good strategy is the following. Here draw its drop um, on nature certain general principle by recognizing in a large set uh, of empirical facts, 
certain general traits that can be sharply formulated. It is mathematical formulation. So search for generalized empirical facts, no perpetual mobile, no ether drift, equivalence principle. Express these facts in a mathematically, in the form of mathematically formulated principles, entropy principle, Lorentz transformations, whatever you want. Elevate this principle to constraints that all laws of nature have to satisfy. Check whether the well-established laws of nature uh, satisfy this constraint. If they do not, change them. Uh, this is the new law. And then, of course, check if the changed equation must have some effects that are different from the old equations that can be tested. Uh, in some cases, we, have, we don't have principles, as in quantum physics. We know that electrodynamics, electrodynamics is probably wrong. Mechanics, everyone agree, agreed at the time, was prob very probably wrong. We don't have a new electrodynamics, neither a new mechanics, but we also don't have any principle to search them. There are too many possibilities. But in the case of, of gravitation, we do have a principle, even if we don't have so much empirical material. So when we see the, I mean, the, 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 the road to general relativity was of course very, um, um, uh, it's very complicated, but the rhetoric that Einstein was using is significant. Uh, in August, 1915, he says, I'm amid a chaos of possibilities. Uh, the demand of general covariance, uh, November 15, he realized limits the number of possibilities. The, the goal is to go, to, to, to go to from Poisson equations uh, which we know are valid to new equations you have to search. Uh, this, he found the field equations by using roughly this method, simplifying a lot. Uh, so the general covariance restrict the number of possibilities and allowed us to find a law of gravitation. But for what matter is concerned, uh, the theory, the principle cannot limit the possibility enough. So we need to, uh, general relativity method represented by the method tensor, which is a phenomenological theory of matter. Um, so when the, we don't have any model of the electron, even not in general relativity, and any attempt made by Hilbert and others at the, at the same time to derive, derive from general relativity a model of the electron are too ambitious. Sorry, again, something went, went, uh, went wrong because the theory does not restrict the possibilities enough. So this is the reason why Einstein compared, again, even general relativity to thermodynamics is a theory which, entail, which entails a general principle, but not a uh, model-like, not a model-like theory, which entails the theory of the electron or whatever you want. Uh, what is, many people thought that the theory was very abstract and sterile, but actually the theory is not abstract at all because the new principle is based, as in the case of special relativity, on empirical fact, identity of inertial gravitational mass. Uh, and second, the theory is not sterile because the theory does not derive nothing by itself. Uh, the principle of relativity is, of course, empty by itself, but it is important because by requiring the all laws of nature, nature should be, general, uh, should be uh, generally covariant, restricts the number of possibilities, uh, and then define the road to the theory of gravitation. So when the theory was confirmed, confirmed, confirmed in 1919, Einstein took the occasion, asked by the London Times, to give an account of a new theory, and he simply put together all these reflections, uh, 10 years of reflections of the, on this matter, and distinguish between constructive theories and principle theories. As you can recognize, the language was used before in many, many occasions. There are theories that try to construct models based on the uh, law of nature that we already know, uh, mechanical model of the gas, electromagnetic model of the electron. Um, and there are theory that analytically formulate mathematically, uh, mathem introduce mathematically formulated criteria that any dynamical laws have to satisfy. Why Einstein wrote this paper? The reason was much more modest and humble than we, uh, we usually thought. The, Einstein was concerned that people thought the theory was very abstract and complicated uh, and very speculative, but the theory was just like thermodynamics, a principal theory based on empirical facts and introducing only a constraint that all possible theories have to satisfy. 
this constraint in the case of gravitation delivers an actual, an actual law, the new, um, uh, the new field equations. In other cases, the principle is not enough powerful to deduce further results. So let's go back. So we have now um, first period, the Swiss, the Swiss, the, the Swiss years, uh, Einstein's work using this strategy and probably realized the strategy was very powerful, expanded it in a more general methodology. In the Berlin years, he found it was most famous, of course, uh, then he found the occasion to present the more general strategies. At the end, he ends up by introducing the distinctions between principle and um, constructive theories. The Princeton years. The Princeton years are interesting simply for this very simple fact. Uh, Einstein again was asked, how did you find your theory in, in the old days? And he, he now used the comparison between thermodynamics and relativity as a description of the methodology of the methodology he actually used to find the theory. So till now we have seems to be a, a posterior reconstruction. Uh, I found the theory, I had to defend the theory. I came up with a comparison with thermodynamics and slowly I developed the general method. In the later years, he seemed to claim, no, no, I already knew that I wanted to follow that method. It is the method I actually followed. We don't have to believe uh, Einstein uh, because there's a construction 40 years later are always complicated, but still what is important are the motivation for choosing this method. So I knew in 1905 already, the Planck's radiation contradicts mechanics and electrodynamics basis on which um, the derivation of such law depends. So mechanics and electrodynamics cannot be exactly valid. So uh, the ground has been pulled out under, under one uh, with no firm foundation to see anywhere upon, upon which one could build. At the time, uh, I thought, let's follow the example of thermodynamics. So reflection of this type made it clear as long as 19, uh, 1900, shortly after Planck's tribalizing work, that neither mechanics nor electrodynamics could, except in limiting cases, claim exact validity. By and by, I despaired of possibility of discovering the true laws by means of constructing efforts based on known facts. Let's try directly to find the laws of nature in the hope that they have solutions that can provide models that account for, for, uh, for, no, for known facts. So the longer and more I despairingly tried, um, uh, more I came to the conviction that the only way to discover for an, was the unit, sorry, that the only, uh, again, the only way of discovery, I think, uh, of a universal for, was a universal form of principle um, could, lead to the, could lead to the assured uh, results. I copy and paste wrongly something in this sentence, but uh, the example I saw before me was thermodynamics. The general principle was there given in the theorem, the laws of nature are such, it is impossible to construct a perpetual mobile of the first and the second kind. How then such universal principle could be found? I have to find a similar principle to the thermodynamics. This is how Einstein described the process in another letter, which I think is not well known, but quite significant. So I know a plenty of experience um, together with Newton mechanics uh, tells me, told me that uh, all um, inertial systems are equivalent. A plenty of experience uh, based on Lawrence Maxwell uh, theory suggests me that uh, the constancy of vacuum speed uh, of light as secure. This is a secure result that cannot be abandoned. Maxwell equations can be wrong. But this aspect of Maxwell equations, certainly not. This these two principles are incompatible. So I, uh, the incompatibility can be overcome by a critical uh, consideration of physical meaning of spatial and temporal coordinates in physics, um, no uh, absolute simultaneity, etc. cetera. A uh, new set of Lorentz transformation. Um, then the content of the theory is expressed in one sentence. The, uh, the physical laws must be or are invariant with respect to the group of the Lorentz transformation. What, what is the key of this derivation? Uh, this analogy, the analogy with thermodynamics is what for instance was the important aspect. Thermodynamics is both are based on general formal principle, uh, principles resting on an empirical basis. Uh, thermodynamics 
postulate of the existence of perpetuum mobile, uh, notice that I based thermodynamics on only on this postulate without any reference to mechanics. Uh, relativity, the impossibility of detecting the ether, plus the second postulate, of course, uh, with no reference to heterodynamics. Why was this so important? But the reason uh, was clearly, again, uh, I tried to allude to this before, I actually alluded to this problem in, uh, for instance, in the letter to Sommerfeld I mentioned before. Uh, the Maxwell equations imply the Lorentz transformation, the Lorentz group, but it's not, it's not true the opposite. The Lorentz group does not imply uh, Maxwell equations. So the Lorentz group may be indeed in defined independently of Maxwell equations as the group of linear transformations which leave a particular value of the velocity of light uh, invariant. Uh, why only this expert? Because I already knew the Maxwell equations was wrong. So the entire theory is not based on Maxwell equations, um, uh, but only on the presupposition um, that uh, constant or the constant C and not on the presupposition the reality of the Maxwell field. The Maxwell field, the continuous field, the electromagnetic field is probably not, you know, does not correspond to reality, but I don't need it. Only the source independence or the velocity of light uh, is needed to derive the Lorentz transformation. This is what Einstein's confirmed in, a, in his last letter about this topic. People told Max Born that, uh, and, um, that uh, there was a book coming out claiming that uh, uh, special relativity was a discovery of Poincaré and Lorentz and not of Einstein. So Einstein answers in this way, of course, uh, relativity was in the air in 1905. Lorentz had already recognized the transformations later named after him were essential to the analysis of Maxwell equations and Poincaré deepened this knowledge. Uh, Lorentz found Lorentz transformations by trying to make Maxwell equations invariant. This is, you can see that uh, historically in, in, Max, in, Lorentz, in Lorentz writings, of course. The new future of special relativity was the realization that the Lorentz transformation transcends its connection with Maxwell equations. They do not depend, they are more general, do not depend on Maxwell equation in their entirety. Entire, entirety. So, um, and has to do with the nature of space and time in general. Third, a further new result was the Lorentz invariance is a general condition for any physical theory. It's in, defined independent of particular dynamical laws, and in particular, independently of Maxwell equations, uh, but it is a constraint which is valid for any physical theory. It was for me very important because I knew the Maxwell theory, sorry again for a repetition, does not represent the microstructure of, radi of radiation. Uh, people read this letter when Einstein was already dead, and all I think understood the point Einstein was trying to make. So Max Born uh, in a paper, gave honor in Einstein said uh, that the Lorentz transformation will still be valid when Maxwell equations had to be discarded as in the case of our present quantum electrodynamics. Pauli claimed the same uh, general postulate which is more reliable than Maxwell equations. It defined independently of these equations. Uh, Langchos, which was, was also uh, Einstein's assistant for a few years, um, the Lorentz transformation occurred in consequence of certain mathematical properties of Max Maxwell equations for Lorentz uh, it were investigated by Lorentz and Poincaré. However, it was Einstein who discovered the proper interpretation of Lorentz transformations as relations between coordinates in general without any reference, a particular reference to Maxwell heterodynamics. So I think uh, summarizing, I hope not too late, um, coincidence versus constraints uh, Lange's in distinction, Mark Lange's distinction, I think is quite powerful to account for the textual evidence we have. Uh, Lorentz and Poincaré consider the Lorentz transformation a byproduct of a certain theory of matter and radiation. Uh, Maxwell theory of radiation and possibly a speculative theory of matter based on Maxwell electrodynamics. So the Lorentz transformations are a coincidence. If this particular theory of radiations uh, happen to be valid, then uh, all these are transformed according to the Lorentz transformations, then the relativity principle is justified and we cannot detect the, the ether, the, the, the motion of the earth with the ether. 
for Einstein, the Lorentz transformations are a requirement that all possible theories of matter of radiation must satisfy. They don't depend on Maxwell equations of any other theory. As we have seen, Einstein already in 1909 tried to modify Maxwell equations. So Maxwell equations can be discarded, uh, but Lorentz transformations do not depend on them. So they are a constraint. This is the point of the theory. They are valid for all possible laws of nature. So let's try to analyze the today debate with this knowledge. Uh, today debate came to the conclusion that um, special relativity is a constructive theory. Uh, for Brown uh, and who, who is followers to say, uh, um, um, uh, the supporters of a constructive approach to relativity uh, is a constructive theory about matter and radiation at the end. It is like uh, at this stage, just like thermodynamics before Boltzmann, so we need our Boltzmann, someone that gives us our theory of matter and radiation. Uh, Lorentz invariance is a feature of this, uh, of this particular law. Um, uh, we don't have that we try to find governing uh, matter and radiation. According to Janssen, to Michel Janssen, uh, special relativity is also a constructive theory, but a constructive theory about the structure of space-time. Uh, Minkowski was Einstein's Boltzmann. Uh, giving us a model of space-time corresponding to the theory. Uh, I think that what is missing, uh, so the two, the two approaches, Paolo Acuna once pointed out in a nice paper, are two sides of the same coin for several reasons, but also for this reason, because they come to the same conclusion that special relativity describe the properties of material systems or the properties of the geometry of the structure of space-time. I think by following uh, Lange's approach or Lange's language, I think it's this, too, this approach proves too much or, or better. Uh, Brown's approach, I think is missing the normative status of uh, Lorentz invariance. If I find a law which is not Lorentz invariant, I have to change the law. Lorentz invariance is the criterion which is more secure than the actual existing laws of nature. I think this aspect is grasped by Janssen's approach, but I think that the, the, the step forward to we need a model of space time does, does not seem to me necessary. Uh, it's possible, but it's not the point of the theory. Uh, and Einstein himself always claimed that Maxwell always, uh, sorry, uh, Minkowski or only gave us uh, a tool to inspect if the laws of nature are Lorentz covariant, which is more simple than previous, the previous tools that we had. So I think it's much better to keep with Einstein's own definition. It is special relativity is a principal theory because the point of the theory is it is a constraint, a requirement that all possible laws of nature have to satisfy. This uh, justify, this, is, this uh, uh, accounts for the explanatory role of the theory. It is by requiring that all laws of nature must be Lorentz invariant that we can obtain new result. Why can we not detect the ether? because all laws of nature are Lorentz invariant, which is exactly like uh, why we cannot construct a perpetuum mobile because energy is conserved. It's a non-casual non form of explanation, but as Lange uh, put it, is a form of explanation. Second, I add, also the heuristic nature of theory relativity is explained in this way. Uh, how, why is having a new kinematics important at all? Uh, why having the new Lorentz transformation is important. Uh, this is not the proper theory. It is important because all laws of nature, the fundamental laws of nature are expressed in terms of the coordinates, the dynamical variables uh, uh, appears in those laws as function of the coordinates. So having the new coordinate transformations is of course a strong constraint on the formulations of this law. Starting from laws that we already know in most of the cases for law velocities, Einstein, uh, we have some single case of uh, particle dynamics, but we can elasticity theory, thermodynamics, uh, hydrodynamics, other dynamics, all these laws uh, were available for valid for low velocity. And we use the Lorentz transformation to modify them, to make them Lorentz invariant, thereby we find new law. This new law might imply some relativistic effect that we can test. So this is a strong heuristic power of the theory. So how does, it, how does the theory one minute works? Uh, I, only a summary of, the, uh, of, the, of roughly the structure of the principle theory. But special relativity needs a new kinematics. We have this twin compatible principle. 
uh, which is, however, empirically based. New kinematics that make them compatible. The new kinematics is true or false. Once one interprets the coordinates as reading of atom clocks, then I can check. Do I, atoms are good clocks? Probably yes. I can check the transverse Doppler effect. Yes, then the new kinematics is correct and the old kinematics is wrong. But this is still not the theory. The content of the theory is the assumption that all laws of nature must be Lorentz invariant. Then I move to, dynam to dynamics. I start to dynamical laws that I already know and I check if they are already Lorentz invariant or not. If they are uh, good, if not, I have to modify them. So I have to find dynamical laws, of course, describing particles and fields, uh, particle mechanics, electromagnetism, elasticity theory, whatever you want. Uh, possibly these laws might have solutions that can serve as models for the observable phenomena, model elementary particles, model of whatever you want. Um, among the solutions, and it comes another point, which is often discussed in the modern, modern uh, debate, there might also be systems that uh, we can use in rods and clocks. And so the circle is closed. Uh, in this case, of course, the validation of the theory is more complex. So in principle, uh, only kinematics plus dynamics, geometry plus physics, as Einstein says in some places, can be tested empirically. Uh, but it's not a justification of the theory. This is not a, uh, an explanation of Lorentz transformations. This is a way in which the theory as a, as a, as a whole uh, can be tested. Uh, thanks. So, Aurelien, you are the first to ask a question. So please go ahead. Okay, so I just said mute. Okay, my microphone was mute. Okay. So thank you for a very interesting uh, historical talk about the, the separation between this um, constructive and uh, principal uh, approach of uh, relativity. But um, you mentioned that the, I have a question concerning the, uh, the, I think somebody which was, you mentioned at the end of, uh, of your talk about the role of Henri Poincaré uh, in the foundation of um, this discussion. And uh, this is for me very, very problematic because you put it only at the end. And uh, I think it should be already contained in the discussion in the Swiss year because it's probably uh, very fundamental to, to understand the, the foundation of uh, principle of relativity, especially because the Poincaré was the first to write about this, really five years before Einstein, at least. So it, and it was written in, uh, as a form of a constraint theory. Then in 1905, he published papers about this, and it was using different approach, both as a principle and both as, a, as you mentioned, a coincidence, I think you call it. Uh, constructive theory and the work of Poincaré was, I mean, containing already Minkowski group theory, was containing discussion about electron theory. And it's, um, I would say that uh, for me, the, this separation between constraint and coincidence was already contained in his, in his work. He was writing a lot of books and articles about this separation. For, for, and it was a uh, for him, a lot of there was a lot of arbitrary in, in this distinction. So, I think that you, you should you should have included more probably discussion about the role of Henri Poincaré in your in your discussion. Uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, uh, I don't deny that the role of Poincaré is much more uh, subtle than I've described here. Two points only to justify myself. First, this is the Einstein's own point of view, mm -hmm. and Einstein apparently never read Poincaré's paper. Uh, uh, we don't know if he read it, he didn't want to mention it. Um, uh, uh, so this is the, the reason why Poincaré is not mentioned that much. Uh, look, this is very strange. Poincaré is not even mentioned by Minkowski, even if, as you said, was already anticipated by him. Uh, uh, of course, this was a very German heavy, heavy, heavy German speaking debate with the exception of Lawrence probably. So my, this might be a reason culturally because Poincaré was cited less than others. Um, uh, and so the lore of Poincaré is very, is very fascinating uh, in, in this case. First of all, uh, not only Poincaré, but also Lawrence already introduced this distinction. Uh, Lawrence in 1900 says uh, there are two types of theories, practically the same thing, without referring to relativity, of course. Uh, 
Poincaré, as you said, even more explicitly in the St. Louis conference, for instance, uh, there are the physics of principles and the relativity principles already mentioned as a principle. So uh, Poincaré is a clear role uh, which is already using the same, the same approach. Uh, Olivier de Rigol, uh, as you might know, uh, wrote many papers on this. Uh, he, uh, he, he also showed in 1908 in his lectures, for instance, uh, Poincaré derived the uh, var variation of the, um, the velocity dependence of mass of the electron, roughly as Einstein did, modifying uh, Newton's laws of motion without any model. Uh, so it is clear that uh, Poincaré would be an interesting case to, to, uh, uh, to analyze. Still, I think that there is a, uh, Einstein is, uh, his perception is somewhat correct, uh, let's put it this way, that he was the only, the only one who recognized the Maxwell equation might have been wrong. And so uh, he wanted to construct a theory which did not rely on Maxwell equations. And I think uh, there Poincaré is more conservative in the sense that uh, he described, just like Lorentz, uh, Maxwell uh, Lorentz transformations as a feature of Maxwell equations. Uh, only it discovered that they form a group and so on and so forth. So this, I think, uh, uh, if one discuss the question of the priority, seems to me uh, uh, a point that becomes with Einstein very clear that uh, this is a requirement for all possible laws of nature. If Maxwell equations will be discarded, Lorentz invariance would still be valid. Uh, I don't know if Poincaré arrived to this point, uh, but this is the point I want to make. Let's let's put it this way. But I think these um, maybe it's not. I would not say that Poincaré will reject electromagnetism, but he, in his first paper, he was already speaking about the possibility to to modify the the. Um, I mean, the force of the law of physics because he wanted to include this uh, famous uh, um, pressure already to stabilize the electron. He would also to apply it to gravitation. Yeah. So, uh, of course, uh, I totally agree with you. The question of the pressure, for instance, is again, uh, how to understand the pressure? Is this a model of the electron? Mm -hmm. And Poincaré was doing the same as everyone else, uh, mm -hmm. simply providing a better model of the electron. There's also people claim this is not a model of the electron. Uh, this is uh, simply making the Lagrangian Lorentz invariant. Um, there's a, a paper by two French scholars. Uh, um, Forgotten their names. One is Braco, I think. Uh, Braco, yeah. uh, the other one is uh, the physicist, which is more famous. Will make this point, which I think is possibly convincing. Um, so, I mean, with Poincaré, the question is clearly, clearly ambivalent. It's not clear. Uh, we can say that he did it before Einstein, or at the same time, uh, or the theory is is different. Uh, my feeling is this uh, this element. Uh, the, um, um, the Lorentz transformations, at, there's, a, there's a, a quote that I didn't use, but it's very uh, clear. The Lorentz transformation has not, uh, have nothing to do with Maxwell equations. It's mm -hmm. a very strong statement. I don't think that, that Poincaré would have uh, emphasized mm -hmm. this statement. Mm -hmm. um, um, oh, yeah. This, I think, uh, the point where I could claim that there's a real originality in Einstein's uh, approach, but of course, you know, uh, we know that Schrodinger's uh, equation, uh, Schrodinger's interpretation was completely different at the beginning. Still, we call them Schrodinger's equation. So why not call the Poincaré's theory of relativity? So that's a debate we, we can open. So, But as I said, this was uh, Einstein's own, po own point of view. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next in line, we have Vasilis. Please, Vasilis, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Now, I don't know the historical details, but I have uh, two remarks to make uh, in agreement with uh, what you presented here. Um, one is uh, uh, the Lorentz transformation, the relativity principle as a constraint, which means that it's not a theory about a, a specific physical phenomenon, but it is a theory about theories. It's at a meta theory yeah. level. So it, it must be a constitutive element of any conceptual framework for physical theories in general. Yeah, I completely agree with you. This is the yeah. point I want to make. Now, um, but uh, if I understood correctly, 
Uh, it must be coupled with a constancy of the speed of light. In Einstein's approach, yes, but of yes. course, the derivations we don't need. Yes, but if so, if it is coupled with uh, the, speed of, the constancy of the speed of light, although it is not a theory of space time, it uh, contains uh, the metrical properties of space time in the constancy of the speed of, because the, the, the speed of light is connected with um, uh, the, the magnetic uh, permeability and the electric. Uh, Okay. Uh, co the electric constant, which uh, specify the metric properties of space-time, so <clears throat> so it is connected uh, in this sense. Although it's not a theory of space-time. Now, the, uh, this is one remark. My other remark is that uh, this idea of restricting the space of possibilities is very very important. It is central, and uh, <clears throat> it reminded me of uh, Hilbert's sixth problem how to axiomatize a physical theory, because he, he proposes to do exactly that, to start from a general class of approaches and then um, introduce step-by-step -step principles, restricting this space of possibilities until you reach a concrete situation. So uh, as, you, as you explained um, uh, Einstein's approach in how to, to cope with this chaotic uh, space of possibilities. It, it, it strongly reminded me of this um, of this suggestion of Hilbert. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much for this uh, for this talk. Thank you very much for both uh, both remarks, which uh, uh, was very useful to me. Uh, I agree with both. Uh, of course, about Hilbert. Uh, for the first, I already said that I agree with his constraint. I don't know about the theory of space time. Uh, what I wanted. There's a debate going on today. Uh, okay, the theory. <laughs> This form of the theory I described is provisional. Uh, the theory is uh, completed if you with Minkowski. Uh, I don't think it's, this point is wrong, but uh, I was only to, to try to make the, the, the point that it is not necessary, that the content of the theory is being a constraint. Uh, and this is the reason why Einstein continued to call it a theory <coughs> principle. For the second remark, I, I didn't know about uh, um, about Hilbert, uh, and I have to think about it. I have to to, to look it up because I, also for me it's a very fascinating point of view to the idea of restricting the possibilities. Uh, I assume that the difference between Hilbert and Einstein was the motivation for this restriction, uh, where Einstein, especially in those years, uh, later it would be different, uh, insisted that the motivation should be empirical. Uh, um, and if you we see the uh, Hilbert's approach to general relativity. Uh, the motivation was more, uh, let's put it, rationalistic. So good theory should be generally invariant. A good theory should be derived by, um, by Lagrangian. Uh, and from that, he believed to not only find a theory of gravitation, but he could find also a theory of the electron, uh, combined gravitational electromagnetism. And there, Einstein was very polemical. I only mentioned this one single letter, but there are many where where it's saying oh, Hilbert is going too far because the two principles uh, that he is using, that I'm using, especially general covariance, are not powerful enough. It can restrict the possibilities enough. But to check um, Hilbert, which has a similar uh, approach in many, in many respects. Thank you very much. For Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Uh, Lorenzo is the next. Lorenzo, please go ahead. Uh, I wonder if uh, you can give um, similar ideas for quantum mechanics. Uh, so there are many principles on which the theory is based, many, many more, I guess, than, uh, than relativity. Is there an approach which perhaps uh, lists all of them? Uh, I think that um, the original new interest for this little article of Einstein was uh, exactly in the, the field of quantum mechanics. So some, um, sorry, I very, Jeffrey Bob uh, tried to suggest that we should formulate um, gen, special relativity as a theory of principles, sorry, quantum mechanics, of course, as a theory of principles. It meant uh, something like informational theoretical constraints. So it's not the proper theory, but put constraints on possible theories. Um, I think this, uh, this line of research was less um, successful. So the debate is less 
um, 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 lively as the, in the case of special relativity. But even recently, uh, I mentioned Michel Janssen. Michel Janssen wrote a paper exactly uh, reproposing this idea uh, together with uh, Michael Kufaro and uh, the guy I've forgotten, uh, and suggesting again that there is an analogy between Hilbert space and Minkowski space time. Both are not proper theories, but put constraints on possible, on possible theories. Uh, I would not able on the top of my head now to, 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 to describe the details. Um, another point I could add is uh, historically there are some uh, historians, sorry, who claim that Heisenberg uh, formulated the uncertain relations exactly as a principle, as in the case of special relativity. Uh, it would be interesting to me very much for other reasons, because, uh, but uh, I don't know the literature that well to confirm or disconfirm this, uh, uh, this hypothesis. If you read the, the San, Fr San Francisco Pedia of Philosophy uh, entry, uncertain relations, there is there um, some papers I mentioned that try to claim that uh, Eisenberg wanted to imitate the same, the same approach. Um, uh, find, uh, by the way, this is the very similar uh, uh, empirical facts force us to change the, the kinematics uh, in the original uh, approach of, of Heisenberg. Uh, and so the analogy is very, is very similar. Uh, the new kinematics in which uh, instead of momentum and, and position, there are matrices. Uh, but I mean, the similarity is striking to say. Uh, and of course, the new kinematics apply to every possible uh, system, just like relativity. And then if you think again, uh, I, uh, to Dirac's approach uh, in which, uh, what is quantum mechanics? Uh, you take uh, Hamiltonian mechanics and change the, um, the Poisson brackets. Uh, and then uh, you do this in, you take the classical theories and do the same for the classical theories and transform that in quantized theories. This is very similar to special relativity and the relativization of classical theories. Uh, there's some ideas, uh, but I'm not an expert. So, uh, but I think it's an approach that I would like personally thought to follow, but uh, it's not my field of, of expertise. To be in sure, sure. To be, to be yeah, sure. Well, I, I would not use uh, the uncertainty relations, but yeah, probably not. Some, like complementarity principle or something like that. Right, yeah, something of course. Like the, the, other, the, other, the other problem is which principle one, one should use. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, the the question, question I always ask to myself is why uh, Einstein did not uh, follow that approach uh, himself and rejected quantum mechanics in block. Um, uh, I couldn't find the proper answer to this to this uh, to this question, um, but he could have used the quantum phenomena as a constraint, but uh, he didn't do it. Maybe it's because it's difficult. We still don't. Maybe because it's difficult. I, or maybe at the time, you know, it was us older and uh, he had some more more fixed ideas. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Next in line, we have uh, Adan. Please go ahead, Adan. Okay. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I found it uh, very interesting, and I think I, I, I agree with the general take on the debate between, you know, uh, constraints and, and coincidences. But I wanted to ask you about about um, the generalization to the context of general relativity. There you talk, you, you said that the principle initially, I, I, I understood that the principle that was playing the, the constraining role was the equivalence principle. Then it seemed that you went to claim that it was a general covariance. Although I know that the principles, you know, they, 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 they receive different interpretations and they are related. Um, I think that the, the, to go to general covariance is not a very good idea because, as, as you said, general covariance that doesn't seem to constrain too much, and also it doesn't seem to to have a clear connection with an empirical generalization, which is the original idea uh, by Einstein. So why why to to go that way? Why why not to uh, stay with with uh, with uh, with uh, the principle of with the equivalence principle, uh, but not interpret it as as a principle of general covariance. So 
in the line of the principle claiming the, the local validity of special relativity or something like this, which connects, you, you know, constrains maybe the, the, the coupling of matter fields to the metric or something like this. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good point. I was also unsatisfied by the part of the talk or, or the there's there a paper on this stuff. Uh, after the, uh, I simply, the, I addressed, uh, I tried not to address general relativity, but I thought it was useful to, to see him extended the strategy to another theory, uh, simply to understand the strategy itself. But I also think that the application to general relativity is less uh, clear, uh, less clear. Of course, general relativity, we, we have first to make a distinction. General relativity is also a theory of gravitation, but of course, uh, when Einstein claims that the theory is a theory of principle, he claims only that the general relativity principle is the principle that we use. And the principle helped, uh, helped him, sorry, to find uh, a theory of gravitation uh, because constrained the possibilities to one possibility. The only gen possible generally covariant generalization of Poisson equations let's not discuss if it is true or not, was what, where Einstein field equations. This is what, as Einstein seems to present uh, the point in several point, in several occasions. Uh, regarding relationship between uh, equivalence principle and general covariance is also very unclear. Uh, so I agree with you again. In early papers, uh, it seems to say, uh, to use more the equivalence principles as a guide, uh, a certain point, um, uh, it became more the principle of general covariance, but let's not forget that he rejected these principles for three years and then came back to it. So the stuff is very complicated. Uh, but the connection between the two principles for Einstein, I think was roughly the following, that equivalence principles um, forced us uh, to, uh, does not allow us to identify a good inertial frame. Uh, so the distinction between good and bad inertial frames disappear and then there is a leap of logic. Let's assume that all coordinate systems are equally good. So I think that there is a logical relations for Einstein between the equivalence principle and uh, general covariance that maybe in modern textbook is not, not defined. Um, um, uh, I, uh, Einstein's assistant, Peter Bergman, usually put it in this way that uh, uh, general covariance is the realization of the equivalence principles in this sense. The current principles makes the search for a privileged coordinate system impossible. Leap of logic, all coordinate systems are the same. The second point is, of course, uh, uh, that you made that the, the principle is not restrictive enough. Uh, there is, of course, the great debate. Uh, there's a Kretschmann objection. Uh, the principle is not restrictive at all. Uh, uh, and Einstein had to reply uh, to, this, uh, to this objection. Uh, it is clear the convention of Einstein is that the principle is very restrictive, more restrictive than the principle of um, Lorentz invariance. Uh, uh, the reason is, I think, is the following. He interprets, the, again, the principle in the sense, uh, a good theory should be so formulated without any reference to a privileged coordinate system. Uh, and uh, if you think uh, classical mechanics uh, or Maxwell equation, whatever you want, they can be formulated during a covariant way, but it is not necessary because there's a class of reference system or coordinate system, and as Einstein would put it, that are better than others, that are privileged. Uh, so a theory in which this possibility is not available, uh, but a number of the theories, the series is very, is very, is very uh, number is very limited. And so general covariance restrict a lot, according to Einstein, the range of possible theories. In particular, one restriction that for Einstein was important all of his life is that necessarily uh, we need a field theory. Uh, I don't know if this is true, but anyway, this Einstein repeats it all the time. There is a reason why for all my life, I search for a field theory of gravitational electromagnetism because uh, general covariance force, forces me to find a, uh, a field theory. So I cannot go with quantum mechanics. This might be a reason why you didn't go for quantum mechanics um, uh, uh, and so on. So uh, I agree with all, all your remarks. Uh, since we are here simply describing Einstein's point of view, uh, this is my answer. Both uh, principles are connected and the general covariance is in Einstein's view, a very restrictive principle. 
Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you. If I may follow up uh, on Adan's uh, uh, question, um, what about uh, Max principle? Because uh, when, uh, when Einstein firstly presented his brand new theory, he said something like, it rests uh, on three principles. So the uh, relativity principle, the equivalence principle, and Max principle. And this principle basically, as uh, Einstein put it, uh, was that the G field, the, uh, the, what we call today Einstein's tensor, the geometry of space-time is conditioned and determined by the stress energy tensor of matter. Now, I think that at the beginning, he was very convinced that uh, um, Max principle in some way um, constrained uh, is, is theory, general relativity. But then it was discovered and proved that general relativity, in fact, uh, admits uh, uh, vacuum solutions uh, which are nonetheless uh, uh, curved. So uh, the, the part where the G field is conditioned and determined uh, in a strong sense by the stress energy tensor of matter uh, does not hold anymore. So I'm curious to know a little bit more, I mean, historically about Einstein's take on Max principles and the consequences uh, of this, uh, let's say, failure, because in the end, not even uh, his theory, uh, uh, let's say, uh, was a, a, a product of uh, Max principle constraining the, uh, the possibility. So I would like to know uh, uh, your, uh, your point of view. Uh, that's a great question also because you point to difficulty in my reconstruction, which I can really solve. So, of course, there are other principles, as you mentioned, for instance, Max principle, which do not fit really well in this reconstruction. I don't know how to put it, but to put them. He never mentioned them in this context. So he usually mentioned the general principle of relativity and the principle of general covariance. So Max, uh, Max principle is indeed a problem. In a sense, it's a principle exactly in the sense I mentioned. It, um, the paper you you mentioned uh, you mentioned um, sorry is uh, the 1918 paper in which he at the end distinguishes the, the three principles as you said. Uh, of course, before that everything was mixed up. Uh, I saw the three principles was very much confused with one another, um, and especially Mark Max principle was uh, very similar to relativity principle. Uh, one of the motivations were of course that uh, rotation should have been just like uh, relative uh, as uh, um, as linear acceleration, as a linear linear motion, uh, just like Marx said, and so on and so forth. Uh, then he abandoned this idea at a certain point when he realized that there were now vacuum solution of the field, vacuum solution of the field equations that correspond to the to the rotation metric of the uh, of um, Minkowski space time. So uh, silently he abandoned this principle, uh, and he reappeared in the form that you described. And then he had to abandon that one again because of the sitter, uh, the debate with the sitter and the vacuum solutions in cosmology. Then the principle became, uh, there's a, a, a great paper by Brown and uh, Lemko on this. Uh, round the 20, try to reintroduce a new principle, which is again, the let's say the principle action or reaction in the sense that uh, uh, it is not more the, the Max principle doesn't work, of course, uh, because the G field is independent of matter. Um, but uh, uh, what is annoying about uh, all the pre general relativistic theories is that the space time cause something without being caused. This is what the Max principle became, so to say. This is a, it's not a Max principle, of course. It is a new principle. So a good theory should not have an absolute space which is caused without being caused. Uh, and this is, I think, the end of the story in the sense that the Max principle would never be mentioned again. Uh, in 1952, there's a, so I remember a, a, a letter to Felix Pirani in which Einstein said explicitly, Max principle is dead, you should not use it. So I think at the end of the story is uh, this change of opinion uh, I mean, the paper which is important uh, is the 1920 paper, F Ether and Relativity Theory, in which Einstein did, and claims that uh, the uh, gravitational field is the new ether. 
uh, is real, just like the ether. It is just like the ether because you can get rid of other fields, but not of the gravitational field. Uh, and it was this new formulation. Um, but uh, I, I, add, I agree with you that again, Max principle or later, let's, there is the separability principle after the EPR, EPR argument. Is this again a principle? Because it's again a principle in the sense that you should exclude theories which are not local, for instance. Uh, so I don't know how to put this, uh, this other principle that sometimes pop up in, uh, in, Einstein's, uh, in Einstein's work. Uh, and I don't think that, as far as I know, the, 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 the textual evidence that there is no answer in the sense that, uh, I mean, Einstein never worked out a coherent theory of this, all this stuff. So we have to extrapolate it with some degree of um, arbitrariety from, uh, from single quotes. Yeah, thanks. Aurelien has a finger on that. Yeah, it was um, a short remark, I think, uh, concerning this, this, this uh, status of the Mach, uh, Mach, Mach principle. It's uh, connected to cosmology. I mean, uh, Einstein was uh, very much interested in, the, in this model of universe, uh, stable universe, uh, closed universe, and introduced the, co the cosmological constant, essentially uh, because uh, the, the Mach principle was playing so much of a big role in his, uh, his analysis. He was thinking that uh, if you don't have this cosmological constant, you will not be able to have a universe which is completely self-sufficient with a, um, a solution which is univocally defined. And without the cosmological constant, he was not able to, to find a solution. And so it was probably one of the interests for him concerning no, I, the math principle. Uh, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, this is what uh, also Antonio was mentioning. But uh, the point is that there he was forced to, to think of a closed universe yeah, yeah, yeah. because he didn't want to have to have boundary condition of infinity. Because if you have boundary condition of infinity, they are independent of matter. Mm -hmm. uh, this was his problem. So let's, there's a letter which says, let's abolish boundary conditions. And so I, lost, I solved the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have the closed universe. But then uh, the sitter came uh, and he showed, no, we could have a, perfectly fine universe, which is uh, uh, empty and curved. Uh, and so this the inertia is determined without matter and the old stuff doesn't work. Uh, and then he reformulate um, the principle in this more elegant way and then he abandoned it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I, of course I agree with you. But again, the Antonio's uh, um, uh, question reemerged, which was the status of this principle for instance, in cosmology, why he excluded, uh, he used it again as a sort of principle that which excludes possible theories, a theory in which matter, uh, space-time is not completely determined by matter is not acceptable, rejected. So it serves again as a restricting principle, uh, but it's not empirical, it's sort of philosophical. So I don't know how to describe it, so to say. Maybe it's only methodology. Methodology, uh, but seems to me very. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I because I know the story doesn't doesn't didn't didn't go well, so it doesn't convince me very much when I read this 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 various use of um, of of the Marx principles. I think that there was a sort of philosophical. Uh, prejudice, as we're saying in, in, in Einstein, the space uh, space time should not exist independently, uh, uh, should not be cause of the phenomena. This is already used. But this is a uh, Marx rhetoric, and he tried to implement it in the theory in various ways, uh, but then he failed. Um, I would say at the end. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thanks. Uh, are there further questions? First questions, second questions from people who already asked. Uh, if not, I, I have a very, a very short question regarding uh, Lange's uh, uh, distinction between coincidence and constraint. And uh, I, I would like uh, uh, to frame, if possible, this kind of distinction in the uh, modern uh, uh, metaphysics uh, of uh, laws of nature. So um, according to the coincidence case, uh, uh, for example, 
facts about the motion of matter, of electrons, for example, um, let's say uh, determine uh, the relativity uh, principle. While for Einstein, it is the other way around. So it is the relativity principle that uh, places a constraint on the way uh, matter uh, behaves. Now, my, um, my question is uh, whether we can, in some sense, associate uh, uh, these two uh, cases to different uh, approaches to laws of nature. So, for example, coincidence uh, can be associated to some sort of Humean take on laws where laws basically are not fundamental and in fact they supervene on material facts while the constraint case uh, goes well along a governing law view where basically uh, what happens in the world is dictated by uh, laws. So my question is, uh, in your opinion, is this kind of uh, association uh, warranted or, I mean, I'm, I'm forcing a little bit too much. Well, it's definitely language. warranted. I think if you read uh, uh, Lange's original papers or books, there are discussion in this direction. I'm simply totally ignorant in this, uh, in this field. So I don't know, it seems to be very plausible that you can uh, frame it in a sort of a more metaphysical way. My, uh, clear that uh, this question of modality uh, uh, and all the relations with modality there in, in metaphysics. Uh, and uh, if I, I had to confess, if I were, if I knew the literature better, I would try, but I don't know that much about that, the kind of literature. This is only, this is my personal problem. But uh, I definitely think that uh, uh, the possibility is there, maybe even the danger and the difficulties with this approach is try to, uh, to, to, to flesh it out uh, in, a, in a metaphysical way. And I don't know, for instance, uh, all the metaphysical impl implication of modality, if everything is so easy as I presented it, for instance, if it might be, what is this mod the, the ontological status of this constraint? These are problems that, uh, um, that, um, that are, uh, of course, very fascinating. Uh, I think uh, uh, in this time, the word, okay, the word metaphysical is complicated, but, um, it's clear that Einstein's approach here is very uh, second order in the sense uh, uh, I, I'm describing how a theory is made. And then, uh, because I've, I have no access to reality directly without the theory. Uh, so I think that, um, sorry, I forgot his name. Uh, I have a, I'm terrible with names. Okay, someone called it en en theorizing realism. So Einstein never says X, Y don't exist. He only says, he always says something like, uh, uh, do we have a good theory which claims that six exists? don't exist? And so all the claims I made are only referring to theories. Uh, these theories are made like this. Uh, uh, and so in the Einstein's text, there are no implication for metaphysics, I would say. Uh, in Langes, definitely. Uh, and since you know the literature better than me, you are more able than I am uh, uh, to, to, to further, uh, to develop the distinction in a metaphysical uh, sense. Okay, thank you very much, Marco. Uh, there is another question uh, from uh, Aaron Sloman. Aaron, please go ahead. Well, I am very much an amateur in this area. Um, and you, you may just say that the question is irrelevant uh, and I'll accept that. I've been wondering about space and time and motion and causation inside the egg of a chicken or a duck or a crocodile or a turtle or whatever, where there is something going on that to me is very mysterious. And for some reason, I never noticed this fact. I mean, I've known for many years that all sorts of animals come out of eggs and that when the egg starts, there's a shell and inside it, there's some relatively amorphous available material. And at the center, there's a small nucleus. And then by some process involving lots of cell division and so on, you an animal emerges, which uh, has a lot of competences. So the new, well, first of all, they get themselves out of the shell. Um, secondly, a newly hatched chick can see things, obviously, and it can go and peck at food. It can walk towards a hen and can drink and so on. 
And uh, first of all, this, as far as I'm concerned, refutes every theory in psychology and neuroscience and philosophy about uh, where knowledge has to come from. Um, and the particular worry I have, which involves space, is how can all those processes that assemble the many parts which get more and more diverse and more and more complex and more and more causally integrated, how can the, that all of that be controlled? And I'm wondering whether there's something about uh, lots of uh, causal mechanism fitting into the same space as a physical mechanism, um, but without needing any extra space. And I just wonder if that rings any bells for anyone here uh, or maybe if someone can refer me to something I should go and read. I don't know, does the question make any sense? Uh, it says, if I understood it correctly, uh, the question is very similar to the one uh, actually the debate is going on. I mean, it's not, it's not referring to, um, um, to biological uh, beings, of course, here we are talking about sure. particles and so on. But the question is, how do they particle know where to go? Uh, let's imagine that the, 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 in the universe, uh, uh, at one moment, there's only electromagnetic force and charged particles. The electromagnetic force disappear. So all particles go all in a straight line. How do they know where to go? Uh, if I understand correctly. So the, 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 there are two possible ideas that uh, uh, space or space time causes them to go in certain uh, in certain direction. And this is the question how can geometry explain how can space or space time be cause of something this problematic? Or people uh, like Brown and others try to say, no, the space is maybe what you were, were saying uh, for biological being is no, are the laws governing the behavior of particles, they have some properties. And this is why the, 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 the particles behave in this way. And space is parasitic to this fundamental law. Uh, this is the, the same debate. Uh, I was trying to find a way out of the debate, saying uh, the special relativity does not say, does not go in neither directions, because the theory says something different and more uh, uh, radical, I don't know what it is, that uh, whatever laws we have, they should have all certain feature. Um, uh, otherwise, there would be empirical consequences that we don't want to have. Uh, and so the, the theory I was trying to propose is neutral between these two possibilities. If space is a cause, existence is a cause of something or the behavior of things, or if, or if space is parasitic to the behavior of things, which is uh, an eternal question from uh, you know, uh, Leibniz and Newton till, uh, to this day. I don't know if I addressed the problem uh, uh, correctly, but this would, would, this would be my answer. Well, um, I can see that something along those lines would be relevant. Uh, it still leaves to me, uh, leaves open to me the question of what changes occurred during the development of the organism inside this limited space that enables more and more complex control well, to go on. Maybe I misunderstood your question. Then, of course, physics has nothing to say about this, as far as we know. I, 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 <laughs> I, I brought in with a very brief uh, comment indeed sure. on the last sure. question, although I agree it does take us a long way from the subject of, of your fascinating and, and very, very instructive and, and beautiful talk. Uh, Einstein, in a very late correspondence, I, I can't remember if it's in the Schilt volume or if it's in one of his later letters, does remark uh, that we can see from a consideration of living systems how incredibly primitive our understanding of the laws of physics still oh. is. I don't know yeah. if anybody recognizes the quotation. <laughs> I don't remember the quotation, but it, seems, uh, ring, it rings a bell. To say. It, 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 it certainly seems apropos of the last yeah, question. Absolutely, yeah. yeah.